Hey, what's going on, Brinkley fans? We have Chapter 14 of the 8th edition for you today. This one is on the Civil War, so covering 1861-1865. Again, please, as always, make sure you check out the description below for videos that match up with the new curriculum. So let's start off talking about secession and military stalemate. So the secession crisis begins on December 20th of 1860. South Carolina is the first country is the first state to secede from the Union. Shortly after, we have other states that follow, including Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana. Jefferson Davis was named the president of the Confederate States of America, and Alexander Stevens was named his vice president. All this is happening while Buchanan is president, and he did not stop secession. He thought that the president did not have the power to do that. So we have the Cretendon Compromise, which was, com which was proposed and is made up of two parts. The first one proposed a constitutional amendment to protect slavery where it existed currently. And the second one would reestablish that Missouri Compromise at 3630 line. It would extend permanently and indefinitely to current and future territory. So if the United States were to gain, for example, Cuba, which is below that 3630 line in the future, then slavery would be protected there. Neither of these parts go are created as Lincoln was especially against number two because he ran in a platform of the non-extension of slavery. So the Upper South chooses sides after April 12, 1862, when Fort Sumner is attacked by the South. You may be thinking to yourself, April 12th, why do I know that date? Why do I know that date? Oh yeah, that is Henry Clay's birthday. So on Henry Clay's birthday, what would have been his 85th birthday, the Civil War starts. Now, ironically, Robert E. Lee was recommended to Abe Lincoln to lead the Union Army, and he turns around and leads the Southern Army. The border states are very important states to know. They are Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, and Delaware, and later West Virginia. They do not secede, so they are the remaining slave-owning states that stay loyal to the Union. And they are very important geographically because they are the middle of the south and the north and they're located on rivers and they have quite a bit of industry as well definitely know the border states lincoln in maryland had southern sympathizers arrested and he also shut down newspapers that were critical of the war effort okay let's talk about setting objectives and devising strategies the confederate constitution forbid any type of emancipation for slaves ever and there are a couple battles to begin, and the, the South won the first battle of the Bull Run, and this really demonstrated the strength of the rebellion and of the South, and many people thought this would be a quick war, and it was anything but. Lincoln begins to replace generals. He replaces General McDowell with McClellan, and this will be a theme that he will do throughout the Civil War. He will constantly replace generals who he feels is not are not committed enough to the war effort. The Battle of Antietam is a very important battle to know. It's the bloodiest day in U.S. history. And the North won, although it had many casualties, and this led to the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, which we'll talk about. McClellan was dismissed after this battle because Lincoln felt that he did not follow through enough with the South. When we're talking about the Mississippi Valley, we see Ulysses S. Grant. He becomes pretty well known during this time. He's capturing forts on the Tennessee River. And the Union also captures the port city of New Orleans, which is a very important city for the South. Okay, when we're talking about total war, we're talking about using all of a nation's resources in the war effort. This is especially used by the North and later the South with less success. But both economies mobilize their countries towards the war effort. So the South succeeded in raising volunteers. They played on that issue, on the idea of honor and duty that was very prevalent in the South. They also instituted conscription or a draft for, before the North did, and both sides were allowed, allowed substitutes to be hired. I'm showing you this picture. This is a picture of Teddy Roosevelt's father. Teddy Roosevelt actually hired a substitute for $300 to fight on his behalf, and that is something that Teddy Roosevelt was quite upset by. He was only about five or six when the war was going on, and he idolized his father, but he said the one thing he thought his father did wrong in life was hire a substitute. Teddy Roosevelt was very pro-war and, and thought that the wars were very important in defining one's manhood. Now, during the war, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, which means that people who are arrested must have a trial. Habeas corpus means if you're arrested, you must have a trial, and Lincoln suspended that. So people now are being arrested and could be held without trial. 
1863, we have the New York City Draft Riot, and this was named a rich man's war but a poor man's fight because we see lots of Irish immigrants and African Americans rioting in New York City, and hundreds of people were killed. When we're talking about women in the war, the Civil War had a tremendous social and economic impacts on women. Widows were forced to work, and women also became nurses. It had a very large impact on the South. Many women took jobs in factories as well. So the North had great advantages during the war. They had two-thirds of the population, two-thirds of the railroads, and 90% of the industry. The South had some advantages, that, although they didn't have the number of factories that the North had, had, they did have few ones, and they had a lot of weapons that were being produced. They also, the South was known as King Cotton, because Cotton was so influential, and they had trading partners with Europe, in particular England. So Congress improved the infrastructure of the United States during the Civil War. This is something that would have made Henry Clay very proud. They encouraged the expansion via the Homestead Act, which gave 160 acres of land to settlers moving west. And they also gave subsidies or money in land to railroad companies. So how the heck did the North pay for this war effort? There were a couple different things. One, high tariffs. And keep in mind that Congress is dominated by Republicans, and Republicans want to raise tariffs. Republicans raise, Republicans raise, RR, Republicans raise. Here's a quick question. What do you think Democrats wanted to do to tariff rates? Yeah, they wanted to see them go down. Democrats down, Republicans raise. They also issued bonds and printed greenbacks. Now, I'm showing you this guy. This is a picture of Salmon P. Chase. He was Lincoln's Secretary of the Treasury and later Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And, oh, by the way, he happens to be from the wonderful city of Cincinnati. So he was a Treasury Secretary, and a lot of the, and these greenbacks were produced under his leadership. And this is the $1 bill back then. You'll notice that he was on the $1 bill, Salmon P. Chase. So that is the way, one of the ways that the war effort was paid, was paid for. The South resisted taxes to raise money. Instead, they issued paper money, which led to just awful, horrific inflation for the South. 1863 is a very important turning point year in American history. We have the issue of emancipation. Now, contraband is a term that was used for escaped slaves that crossed over into the Union and then remained free. And they worked at camps and they fought in the war. Slavery ended in Washington, D.C. and territories in 1862. And on January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation took effect. And what this did was it freed all slaves in areas of rebellion in the Confederacy. So only areas that were still fighting. So New Orleans that was under, under the control of the Union and Tennessee, which was under the control of the Union, slaves were not freed there. Slaves were also not freed in border states. And the reason for that is that Lincoln feared that the border states would then secede and fight on behalf of the South. So these border states, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, did not see slavery outlawed. And this helped keep Europe out of the war. Britain, in particular, was very anti-slavery. And it made it hard for Britain to side with the South because they were pro-slavery. And this also changed the aim of the war effort from preserving the Union to outlawing slavery. So two battles Two big areas that you should be familiar with, Vicksburg and Gettysburg. In Vicksburg, Mississippi, the city surrenders to Grant on July 4th, 1863. And as time went on in the war, many escaped slaves, if they were ever caught, they would be re-enslaved or just massacred by the South. This is um, just a horrible tragedy for many slaves. Robert E. Lee meets up with the North with the Union military in Gettysburg. It's a three-day battle in the North winds, but they suffered very heavy losses. And Republicans, as a result, were elected into office during midterm elections and in state elections. And King Cotton ends up failing the South. Britain actually does not become as does not give as much money to the South as the South had hoped via trading. So soldiers and strategy, let's talk about the impact of black troops. 200,000 black troops were recruited to fight for the North by 1865. Very famous example is the 54th Massachusetts Infantry. If you've ever seen the movie Glory, it is about it. It stars Matthew Broderick and Denzel Washington in it. And it's a very good movie. I highly recommend it. Black soldiers, unfortunately, were paid less than whites, and they also fought in segregated units. Ulysses S. Grant became the head of the Union Army in 1864, and heavy casualties occurred under his leadership. He was not afraid to lose a lot of men if it meant that 
the war would end. William Tecumseh Sherman, you may be familiar with from his march to the sea. He invaded Atlanta. He was a very famous Union military leader. We see as the war goes on that the trench system begins to be introduced on a small level. And Sherman institutes the scorched earth policy. And the Shenandoah Valley was destroyed due to farmer support of Confederates. So in other words, Sherman was not afraid of taking the war to civilians. So he would destroy farms. He would destroy cities. Anybody that would show support for the Confederates, he would not hesitate to destroy their homes. And he argued that war is hell. That was a famous quote by him. So the Republicans briefly changed their name to the National Unity Party. And they nominate Andrew Johnson, a Democrat from Tennessee, to be Lincoln's running mate. General McClellan, the guy that Lincoln dismissed, he ran for president for the Democrats. Some Democrats called for peace with the South, and they were labeled copperheads. Now, Sherman, going back to him with his idea of war is hell, he encouraged his army to destroy railroad lines in Atlanta and in the South. He really wanted to cut off and destroy the infrastructure. Copperheads, again, as I mentioned, were Democrats that spoke out against the war. And Lincoln won the election with 55% of the popular vote, but he wins a landslide electoral majority. You can look here. Everywhere is pretty much pink, except for the few blue states won by McClellan. Now, obviously, the Confederate states were not voting during this time, so that's why you only see Louisiana and Tennessee, because they were under control of the Union. The 13th Amendment was approved in 1865, which provided for the emancipation of all slaves. And Sherman did not differentiate between civilians and soldiers, as I mentioned before. And his march to the sea was a 300-mile march from Atlanta, in which everything along the way was destroyed by Sherman and his men. He did set some land aside for freed slaves in Georgia. And... The, the Confederacy is quickly collapsing, in large part due to Southerners beginning to resist the draft. Blacks were used by the South, some slaves in the war effort, but it was too late in the war effort for it to contribute anything. And on April 9, 1865, Robert E. Lee surrenders to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. Over 600,000 soldiers, North and South combined, died in this bloody four-year-long war. All right, let's do a quick review. The election of 1860 was a huge turning point. Be able to identify the border states of the border south. Know what total war means and that both the north and the south instituted it. Be familiar with ways that the north paid for the war. And know what the Emancipation Proclamation did and did not do. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. Here I have a picture of Abe Lincoln reading, about to read the Gettysburg Address. See if you can identify him. If you don't know where he is in here, check out my video on the Civil War in the description. I have him pointed out in there. I thank you guys very much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the section below. I will see you right back here for Chapter 16, which deals with Reconstruction. Have a good day, guys.